And this is the stuff I want every patient to know. And if you've been around some of you more veteran patients, hopefully you've heard this. But I want to make sure the new ones hear it and everybody that is general public hears this because this is such a great example. Um, if you have heartburn or indigestion, you know, um, you probably think, I have too much stomach acid because that's what the commercial tells you. It may be even what your doctor tells you. Um, well, it's humanly impossible to make too much stomach acid unless you have an exceedingly rare syndrome, Zollinger Ellison syndrome. I've never seen it. Debbie, former PA of mine, Debbie, but a, a veteran of the medical community was, was SWAT surgical for years, a nurse in the OR before that. I mean, you never see, I, in all my years at UT Houston Medical School, I never saw that. But, I mean, half the population is, is on an acid-reducing medicine. So you can't make too much stomach acid. Normal pH in your stomach is one to two. That's normal pH in your stomach. My six kiddos that we have tonight, if you went and measured their stomach acid uh, after they ate dinner, it'd be a one. And that's normal. That's, it's, that's like battery acid. Battery acid's a 1.5. This is normal. All my kids are at this right now tonight, and they're not complaining of heartburn. That's because their acid is down here where it's supposed to be. Acid up here is going to be a problem. The stomach lining is designed to handle acid. There's a mucus layer and it's supposed to, I mean, when it all works right, everything's great. You can handle the battery acid in your stomach. But up here you can't. And when it's up here, you're going to have symptoms and that's a problem. But obviously the question is going to be, why is it up here? It's a location issue, not an acid production issue. This valve is the lower esophageal sphincter. That's where the whole question should be. Obviously, this, I mean, it should seem pretty common sense. What's up with the valve? Why is the valve not squeezed tightly shut? That's how it should be. That's how it always is, except when you swallow food, it'll open up, let the food pass, and it closes right back up. So if you have acid in your throat, this is opening up inappropriately. It's, it's loose. It's flapping there in the wind or whatever. It's just not squeezing. Either the signal from the nerve to that muscle to tell it to squeeze in working, or it is working, but that's just a pressure. That's just a muscle that can contract a certain amount of pressure and the pressure from beneath it is greater and it pops it open. It's just a pressure valve. And so there's something that's causing that. It turns out, as Jonathan Wright um, so elegantly explain, eloquently explains in his book, all the things that cause that valve to open up <clears throat> have to do with too low of a stomach acid, a pH of four or five or higher. Not enough stomach acid. One example is <clears throat> the valve at the bottom of the stomach. All your food sits down here after you, you've chewed it, and the enzymes and digestive juices, the stomach acid's worked on it. You've got a big ball of soup there, um, stomach chyme. Well, one of the triggers for this valve to open to let it down into your intestine is this stomach chyme has to be at a pH of around 2 to trigger the opening of the valve. And if it's not then this stuff just kind of sits here and ends up fermenting and making gas. And that expansion of the stomach will open the valve up. That's one reason. And there's two or three and four other reasons explained in the book. One of the theories, I haven't seen this in the literature, but the theory he proposed in the book is there's receptors at the top of the stomach. The receptors are keyholes. The key that fits in the keyhole here would be stomach acid that fits in the keyhole. And when you have enough keyholes filled in with stomach acid, it sends a signal to that muscle to squeeze. If those keyholes are empty because there's not enough stomach acid, you don't have a signal. The other thing Dr. Wright explains is um, bugs in your gut, in your stomach. Every bite of food you eat is covered in bacteria, fungus, mold. You don't see the mold until the bread's real old, but it's on there. It's on there on the first day. Um, you know, if you went home tonight, unplugged your refrigerator and duct taped it shut and just left it for a week and then went back and opened it up, it'd be full of mold. How'd it get in there? Because it was already on the food. All our food has bugs on it, but stomach acid kills bugs. Every bug known to man pretty much is killed by stomach acid. Um, <clears throat> that's why God gave us the stomach acid, partly to kill bugs. Before there were antibiotics, doctors used hydrochloric acid as an antibiotic in World War I. They did it IV, they did it IM, a shot in the hiney. They did it nebulized, they did it rectally for prostatitis. It's a great germ killer. 
I have a book from 1935, got it from a bookstore in London that has all the protocols on how to use hydrochloric acid to kill bugs. So it's a great germ killer. All the food that you swallow every day that has bugs on it, it kills them. If you don't have enough stomach acid, you don't kill the bugs. And they sit here and overgrow, and they ferment the food too because the other reason stomach acid is there is to break your food down. Turn the steak into steak soup. If you don't have enough stomach acid, then you have some partially digested food particles here, and you've got a bunch of bugs that haven't been killed, and they just ferment that and make the gas. Bugs overgrow down in the small bowel. It's called small intestine bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO or SIBO. Same thing. When you don't have proper stomach acid, proper motility, and the right pH, these bugs overgrow. They produce a gas. We can actually measure this gas in our clinic. And it creates a pressure, intra-abdominal pressure that rises and pops the valve open. But everything, all the explanations in that book, all have to do with not enough stomach acid. And it blew me away when I learned that. And after I read that book and went to Dr. Wright's conference, I, took, I employed that knowledge in a patient I had in post this young middle-aged cowboy dude, great guy, but he was my patient for seven years and almost the first year I was in post, he came to me with heartburn and I put him on Zantac at the time, or he was already on Zantac, I put him on Prilosec. He did good for a year or two, but he came back after a while because it quit working, so I doubled his dose. He went away and he did good for a year and he came back because it quit working, so I put him on Nexium and then he went away and he came back and so then I doubled his Nexium, then I put him on Zantac and Nexium and then I put him on Zantac, Nexium and Carefate and then I didn't know what to do, so I've sent him to the GI guys in Lubbock, they put him on Dexalant and this is over m many years. Um, and at the time, I didn't know what Dexalant was. It was brand new, but it's just a high-powered acid reducer that blocks all your acid production. Um, well, and then he came back to me because that quit working. And I just read Dr. Wright's book. So we stopped his acid reducers, and then we did things to turn his acid pumps back on. The hydrochloric acid is made by these little proton pumps. Proton pumps are turned off by high-sugar diet, and they're turned off by stress amongst other things. So he had to bring the stress down and he had to get off sugar. And then we supplemented him with some things that increased his, or decreased his pH, increased his acidity, and the valve closed. In 30 days, he went to symptom free. After seven years of more and more and more and more medication. So this is just one example of um, option three, fix it. 